finally april and i'm sure a lot of you are starting to get that hardcore jones in for a good music festival i'm right there with you slaving away in the office hour by hour while daydreaming of funky jam bands on summer afternoons and super weird heavy bass music throughout those warm nights i often talk about how transcendental the festival experience can be and that's why i'm extremely super duper happy to be bringing on all of the artists we've had over the last few weeks and today we have Yet another shiny gem of a human being from this psychedelic subculture. Nicholas Heilig is a live painter who has been on the road and slinging his unique painting skills on stage with some awesome bands over the last five years and has developed a really bright and unique style with his creations. As I often recommend, this would be an excellent time to go ahead and look up Heilig's art online through the show notes of this episode and enjoy the wondrous whimsy of Heilig's magical imaginings. As a budding leader in the artist community, Heilig is inspiring emerging creators to forge symbiotically supportive connections with one another and fearlessly forge ahead with their paths. As Heilig states on his Patreon page, when one rises, we all rise, and even the simple act of kind appreciation for another can have the most dramatically positive effect on their energy. So please make sure to find Heilig online and show him some love. And now let's all join together in generating some gigantic excretions from our gratitude glands and gently lob them through the ethernet towards the soul of our epic guest for today, Nicholas Heilig. Thanks for coming on the show, dude, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, that was a very kind intro. I'm really excited to be here. Cool, man. Have you done any podcasts before? I haven't yet, but uh, I'm hoping to dive into it and kind of just getting into this video thing uh, with Patreon and it's it's pushing me to to investigate it. So hopefully this will be the first of many. Yeah, I think it's an awesome way to get your messages out there to people beyond just the actual paintings, especially someone like yourself. I, I was reading some of your own writing on your social media about your desire to create and, and make communities for artists and help the emerging artists too. And yeah, that's what I'm all about as well. The emerging artist is my favorite kind. I love the uh, big visionary artists a lot too, but just gets me really stoked when I see somebody for the first time realizing what they can do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's really important knowing myself from my own experience. There was a lot of hurdles and kind of a lot of trial and error because I didn't have anybody to show me the way. Uh, I don't have any family members really that were involved as art professional artists. I do have very supportive family members, and I think that's a, that was another big step in allowing me to do this. But I think if we could provide some sort of platform, any type of springboard where you can show emerging artists how it's done. These things aren't necessarily particularly hard, but if you don't know somebody that's already doing it, then it can be maybe difficult to look up or figure out what you're supposed to be doing. So I think that's the biggest thing is it's like if you sit down with somebody that knows Photoshop or Illustrator, you can be using the program completely different than one of your friends. And if you sit down together and just for five minutes, you'll learn so much. It's not particularly hard. It's just that you might not have been aware of whatever tools they were using. Yeah, I think it's super important to diversify what tools you do use because just getting ahead in one type of creative path can totally unblock you on the other ones. Oh, absolutely. And I don't know, I know myself recently, I, I mentioned uh, Illustrator and Photoshop because I've been, I've been looking at these programs a lot more in the past couple of weeks doing tutorials to figure out font and text, um, working on some album artwork. Uh, and the person who was signed up to do the text isn't going to have time to do it. So now I'm, I'm going to jump in and do it myself, even though it's not my favorite thing. But it's really fun just exploring the program and, and seeing really the capabilities of where you can push it. And all it takes is a, a simple search on Google or YouTube. Yeah, man. So how did you get, break into doing album artwork? Because actually, that's something I'd like to do. I, I do some digital art myself. I, I started out learning Illustrator. That was kind of the first thing 
Illustrator and Sharpies. Those were my two first things as a, cool. an artist a few years back, you know, and it'll just turn in one thing to another. If you learn one of the Adobe programs, especially, you can learn the video ones too easily. Absolutely. That's a good combination. I think as far as getting into album art, it's just getting out there, meeting the bands, making contacts with the people that might need that work. And you might want to, for a suggestion for emerging artists, is just start small with some type of local band get good pictures of what you actually produce and then you can shop that to other people. And I recommend the same thing for people wanting to get into live painting, kind of just start small locally, maybe a friend, you know, is a singer songwriter, or you have some friends that are in a band paint with them and videotape it. It's important to document it. And then you can show that to larger promoters, venues, festivals. It's really big having some type of evidence of what it is you actually want to provide for entertainment. And I'm seeing more and more of the art creeping into just the everyday small local show in my area. So that's pretty cool. And every festival, it seems like that's a component of it now. And just even a few years ago, that was more of a, not a complete rarity, but it wasn't so consistent. I really like seeing how many avenues of creativity converge. You know, they call us a counterculture, but really I see it as this is actual culture and counterculture is the garbage that is foisted upon us as, you know, citizens (laughs) sure no absolutely i think i do think about this the the idea of culture uh quite a bit and i just posted some uh, comedian talking about how nationalism is just stupid like kind of having pride over these things that you're actually not connected to in any way personally you know it's interesting in america i don't know what our culture would be uh maybe sports like football or something or baseball because we're this amalgam of all these cultures we don't necessarily have our own thing that pulls us together and i think i guess for different people you know it might be religion for other people with our festival tribe it it tends to be music that brings us together and i really do feel like we are fostering a community of people we might only see each other two or three times a year Uh, physically. But now with the internet, we're able to organize and coordinate without necessarily seeing each other in person. And I think that's really exciting for what open source and creative thinking individuals can do. It's going to be a pretty exciting future. I think we're, uh, we're lucky to be here when we are. Yeah, I think the future, you know, once we have robots doing all our jobs anyway, we might as well all become artists. <laughs> if we ever manage to create a completely abundant society and utilize technology to the fullest, then where, you know, the, no one really actually had to worry about what they needed to take care of themselves as much and they could be self-reliant in our new world. <laughs> and not saying like that, you know, because that's a, a big thing. I, I don't imagine a future where there's like a magical replicator machine that gives us everything instantly. More like a future where we all kind of become not just artists, but fully the creators of our life experience and and create that abundance that is possible. And if that future ever happens and we didn't really need money in the same way, I could see art becoming the currency. Sure. Sure. And 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 creative kind of creative thought, whether it be a physical a physical thing or just the idea, somebody that can think creatively. And I think that sort of already is is kind of happening. That is currency today, original thoughts. And um that might just be partly because of our education system and how we kind of drill, drill that out of most people. Um, and the artists are the ones lucky enough to stay connected to that mode of creation where you can see other possibilities and extrapolate and theorize about future possibilities. I see that as the expression of love, actually, because a person that you love completely and unconditionally, the way that you look at them is that they have all this unbridled potential and you just appreciate that and you don't want to control or restrict any of it, you know, is not atta- not attached love. That's like the real definition of love. So self-love is when you look at your own life and your own self and you see infinite possibilities about what you can do. And that's what you focus on. That's actually how you love yourself. Because everyone's saying all the time, especially in kind of like new agey stuff, you got to you got to cultivate self-love. And there's a lot of ways that you can answer what does that mean, especially with just simple physical care. That's a big part of it. But looking at yourself as having more unrestricted, pure, infinite potential is actually, in a way, a really massive part of loving yourself. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to um, give yourself the respect 
to acknowledge that and then to act on it. And I think, you know, I'm happy you're, you're mentioning uh, kind of the woo woo of the new age <laughs> religions. I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical and I'm, I'm always, I'm a little bit agnostic. I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm, I'm always quick to say, well, we're not so sure, right? I'm never 100% sure about anything. And when somebody claims they can tell me that they are, I'm a little bit wary of that, uh, especially, <laughs> you know, when it comes to things that are spiritual in nature. And I think it's very important for me to point out that I think that there is value and there is personal truth and we can speak of these things, but as soon as we try to kind of apply that inner realm outward and prescribe for others what that is, that's, that's when it gets a little bit dicey for me. So I think it's, you know, it's just prudent to stay wary of, of assuming you know and I think the, you know, the wise man is always going to, is question and, and just push themselves. And that comes back to this self-love is just give yourself the respect of knowing that you're, you're capable of a great many things. And if you see somebody living a life that you want to live every day, make steps towards that goal. I think that's, that's all we can really do. Yeah. I'm totally on board with the way that you put it, not prescribing your inner truth for others. I'm actually somebody that, especially historically, have been pretty guilty of that because I'll find things that work so dramatically well in my life that I think everyone should try it. And it's not that I'm, you know, like tyrannically forcing anybody to meditate, but I do go on and on about how you probably should meditate. <laughs> and that might be one that actually does wind up being kind of universally beneficial, but because it doesn't have any dogma attached to it about what it means or what you should do while you're meditating per se. And so what, what I find with especially with new age stuff lately, it's not that different to me than the classic religions because people that get really wrapped up in magical thinking, which is like childlike thinking where you associate one, uh, one action or uh, one condition with an outcome that you can't actually correlate it to physically. That that's where things, like you said, they get, they get really dicey and we wind up with people saying like, Oh, well, I can't do this because the universe just won't allow it. And that's like the same as saying that God wills something or another. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think it's an easy uh, trap to fall into, I think. So it makes me think of a theory of everything by Ken Wilber. And basically he poses a framework where we can talk about kind of how different people are viewing the world. And he would say uh, the mystic viewpoint is the people that are, you know, taking uh, religions in a certain way. And that's all to do with magic and maybe not quite understanding. And then there might be a rational viewpoint that looks at it and says, well, this is nonsense because rationally, you know, we shouldn't be doing A, B or C. And then you can look at it from a different viewpoint, maybe from a poetic viewpoint where you're taking in the lesson. So depending where you're at on your spiral of development, basically, he's suggesting that naturally that's the filter that you're putting on and it helps to provide a framework to talk about this and to to allow us people at different levels of that development to still civilly have a discourse about things and realize that if that's where your understanding is maybe you need to approach if you're trying to convince someone of something you have to approach from their level of understanding you can't expect them to all of a sudden develop years down their spiral. That's really well put. Ken Wilber, I've heard of that book several times in in the past. And wh what it makes me think of is how you might get somebody that is going to tell you, yeah, I'm part of the rainbow light warrior tribe from galactic star seed, uh, planet Alpha Centurio, 97 and we're all coming together 144,000 we're going to cleanse the world of the darkness and banish the Illuminati or whatever and, and like well look I'd love to talk to you about what's going on with secret societies and the Illuminati and I'm fine with you being an alien in a human body a alien soul in a human body all that's cool but I'm not going to drink that kind of a Kool-Aid you know, but I do like, I do totally allow in my own mind, I think it's fine for all of us to make it up as we go and be whoever we want to be. You have the right to create any meaning you want out of your own life and symbolically associate things to, that mean certain things to you and have your own magical language for the world. 
And that's fine. It's like you said, it's just not really cool to try to tell other people this is the way you should look at it. And whenever you get that mysterium, that mysticism and that I have a communication with some kind of whether it's aliens or God and only I've got it and I'm the medium that channels that to you. Well, that's no different than what the Catholic Church has done for 2000 years and what other things like it did before that. So I'm not down. Yeah, precisely. That's like uh, the lady who made that uh, What the Bleep Do You Know movie. She says she's like speaks to some uh, deity and that's how she gets this information. So that was the first. I, I really enjoyed that movie and it does have some good information. But if you research it, a lot of the experts they interviewed were angry that they were taken out of context by this lady. And then I started researching. And as soon as I saw that, I was kind of like, okay, you know, this is, this is at least part hoax. And the lady's trying to make money off of selling uh, fake ideas. Um, And, you know, it's kind of a little disappointing because she's piggybacking on some really exciting true ideas that are coming out of string theory, which is, you know, it's unfortunate, but who knows, at least maybe it'll get some people interested. And even if most of the movie was debunked, maybe it got some people thinking. So ultimately, I think, you know, could have had some positive effects. But uh, yeah, you got to be wary of any of the people that claim they're a guru. There's also the phenomenon of people channeling in a mediumship capacity that from my research on topics like it seems like there's a lot of cases where there's serious validity to what's going on. So it's crazy. You know, like I don't want to follow somebody around because they hear the specific voice of some being or deity and they have the truth because I feel like everyone is capable of finding that connection to truth within themselves, whether it comes in the form of a voice in your head that you think is an alien or what you perceive as being your higher self, the full unconscious part of your mind in illuminated communication with the conscious part of your mind. I think because, you know, your mind actually knows so much more than what you're paying attention to right now. You have to have like 40 billion bits of information held in your unconscious mind just to process the 4,000 bits that your conscious mind is, is doing at all times. So I feel like it's simpler to just call it, you're talking to that part of yourself that you normally can't tap into. Sure. And I, you know, I could get down with that as uh, even at the very basic level, something like sight, we don't see the full spectrum of light waves. Right. And then something like so easy, everybody can be like, okay, I agree with that. And it's like, well, what do you think about dimension? It's like, We've known for a long time that there's more than three or four or even five dimensions, but we don't see those. So I think that, you know, if you're a critical, critically thinking person, you have to acknowledge that. And also, I think it would it would be silly to not be interested in that and kind of just accept it for what it is, something that's that is kind of magical and that we don't we haven't figured out, which is, you know, makes life interesting. Yeah, it's just like the development of the artist. There's no end to coming to understanding of nature and the world we find ourselves in or what ourselves have the potential to do. The artist is just constantly trying to keep digging that hole and see how much farther the self can go. And this is something I got from Randall Roberts, but basically you're like a mole just digging through your hole. And sometimes the dirt chunks that you throw back have diamonds and gems in it. And people are just flocking around your dirt and like, Oh, look at these. And you're just like, I'm digging a hole. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good analogy and makes me think of the fact that it does take a lot of persistence and just trial and error. Like you should really, as an emerging artist, you should be experimenting with every medium that you can so you can actually know for certain that you're using the medium you should be using. But just really being fearless in both your mediums and how you're making your marks and what type of projects you're approaching. If you just throw all critique out the window for a little bit and just create a lot, you're bound to happen on something that is going to be interesting and and pull other people in. And if you're too concerned with making something that everybody else is going to love, you're going to confine yourself so much that you'll probably never find your soul that will connect with other people. Right. I think there's plenty of, there's so many artists out there and I think the, the key, the thing that you're really looking for, if you're trying to be a, an artist as a, a profession, is you're trying to figure out what it is that you provide to the market that is unique and very desirable. And I think that's the, the easiest way to do it is just 
just make stuff that's uniquely you like crazy all the time. And then hopefully you find something that you're engaged with enough that you like to keep doing it. Like you can do it for 10 years and other people want to buy it. That's the, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. I just explore around and it take, I really, the only thing that I've found that I can just make repeatedly, that's kind of the same thing turns out to be podcasts <laughs> as cool. far as like other forms of art. I, you know, I, I don't get that into just practicing the same type of things over and over again, but what I do create, I just do it the way that I would do it. Whatever it is that I can do or know how to do instinctively or intuitively that's the way to make the thing that's uniquely yours. As it turns out, it's not, there's no big secret behind how do you express yourself? It's just, well, how would you do it? And you just answered the question right there. How, whatever you know how to do, try that. And then you can add things on as you go. But the muse or the creative spirit doesn't really strike you unless you're consistently there showing up. Yeah, absolutely. You said it, man. You just dive right into it and you go for it. Do what feels natural. Even with, you know, something like Photoshop or video editing, I've been doing, I took a break for a year or two from that. And I've been doing a lot more. And when I started, I was just doing the most basic things. I was taking a lot of video and I was speeding it up, putting in a soundtrack and that was it. And then slowly over the years, I'm starting to learn another trick here and there and just not, you know, I'm not forcing it or worrying about, I'm not making professional level video or I don't have a professional level video camera yet, but just jump into it. And then that is going to inform the steps you need to make it more professional. And until you do that first couple of steps, you're not going to know what those, those other key elements are. Yeah. And as far as tools go, like whether it's a camera or anything else, you should just see what you can do with the entry level tools. And don't worry about stressing, trying to get that medium level range tool anyway, or a high grade tool, I should say, because, you know, once you finally can afford the, the medium range tools, those are probably better for you anyway, because you won't be worried about breaking it or losing it as much as getting like the ultra expensive yeah. thing. And then eventually there'll come a point in your, your process where you actually are ready to get the super duper tools, but just like, just do what you can with what you've got, because especially with cameras, you don't have yep. to have an expensive camera to turn what you see into a work of art. It's actually a lot more about your skill with the camera and knowing how the settings work and also what you are thinking of taking a picture of. And now that we've got Photoshop, you can pretty much correct for the deficiencies of your equipment unless it's an extreme case like you know, you're trying to shoot something really, really dark that's moving really fast or something. But that's going to be hard for anybody. Totally. Totally. Yeah. You have to have the right setup. I was really surprised to find out that my iPhone, it's not a new one. It's either a four or five. I don't even remember. It has better video than my laptop. So I went to do a, a live stream for a Patreon reward the other day. And yeah, my phone is way better. So I'm pretty sure everybody has a, a smartphone. And if, you, like you said, if you have good lighting, uh, you can get professional level results pretty easy. I forgot to do my patron live stream for March. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I know, but nobody seemed that upset about it. Nobody hit me up. So I guess it's okay. Now nah, it's hard sometimes though. Once you're coming up with all the things that you want to do and provide and you want to be consistent with sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I buy it off more than I can chew a little bit. And you know, Patreon is one of those tricky things that it's hard to even know the sweet spot of offering people something they want or just kind of wasting your energy posting stuff that isn't really drawing people to what you're doing as much as other things you're doing. Totally. Totally. I think that's one of the things I read about when I was starting it that caught my eye was, was everybody was saying, make sure not to offer rewards that take up all of your time, which, you know, that then you're just, you're spinning tires and it's not helping you move forward. Yeah. You want to provide something that you're doing anyway, that, is something that they want. And there's a lot of ways that someone can come up with that reward system. I think Patreon is really cool for what it allows artists to do, connecting directly with their fans. And hopefully it stays on the up and up and doesn't get weird or any, do anything shady with, sure. <laughs> you know, as it gets larger, you always have to worry about the big internet tech companies as they expand. Yep. Well, Hey, you know, that's, 
Yeah, classic story. It's like Google do no evil, right? And uh, you knew that Facebook Zuckerberg was no, no ads, no ads. You knew that he was going to implement that as soon as it was worth enough. And sure enough, he did. And then Facebook bought Instagram. So they're running on the same algorithm. And I think it's really exciting. Something like Patreon, if it manages to replace some of that content, it would be great. Instead of these big platforms getting paid, we can get actually some people that are creating the content paid. Should be amazing. But yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised how those things go. And you even see with Patreon, recently they tried to implement some changes to make some more money, of course. And the community had a giant backlash and they, they stepped back from doing those changes. So I think the more and more that the, just the masses kind of call out the systems of control, we're going to see those things break down. And that's really, for me, what's the most exciting part of the internet, as long as it continues to go the way it is going just access to information. I think that really, it changes everything. You know, the access to information is how you're going to view the world. And so we're in pretty crazy times where the average person has untold just knowledge of worldly happenings, which before we would have only been, you know, a few dozen people in the know. So that's, that's pretty cool. I have big hopes for it. I think I figured it out. I think your mic is actually on the headset. Isn't yeah. It? Oh, yeah. Just bend it slightly closer if you can. I wasn't sure if it was going from the laptop or from here. Okay. Well, I just bought them. So <laughs> thank you for getting those for this. Like, no uh, hopefully it comes in handy later. Yeah, too. I'm, I'm definitely going to need them for future podcasts. So. Yeah, that's something I would recommend to artists in general is try to get on to a podcast because it's a good way to get exposed to new people. That was one of the main missions of even making this podcast is to be the uh, bridge for both a bridge for emerging artists to find more of an audience and then also a place for established artists to drop mad wisdom, you know, kind of both things. But what you're saying about the accessibility of information and in, in the news and stuff right now, it's kind of, well, it's always been this way, but it's a huge point of, of mine anyway, to like be really aware of what I'm paying attention to regularly, because there is a lot of insanity going on. You could lose your mind trying to figure out what shooting was actually engineered by what government or what secret society or group. And all of that, you're going to just end up arguing with people uh, that you love about points that don't actually really matter because we do know plenty of facts about the control structures that we don't need to argue about. And so like for me, it's become more about looking into history than anything else because stuff that's happened a few decades or, or even further back is a lot easier to get a grip on because more people have actually spent the time researching and vetting out what really happened with stuff. And there's so much crazy stuff that's happened in history that informs us about why things are the way they are today, that it's a lot more valid and useful. And we don't have to argue about some of those points. They're much more set in stone, especially when you start challenging the things that they taught you in those indoctrination stations called schools. And so that's actually something that can be really liberating for a creator as well, because getting a grip on understanding the psychology of our culture can help you speak to that culture and possibly even make inroads towards healing it if that's your intention, which for many artists it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think that should be one of the main modes that artists are working in. It is our job to get people thinking in a different way. And often that is directly tied to matters of social justice. You know, I would go back to, I think it's a, I think it's a really great point about the infighting that is kind of, I don't want to say orchestrated because it doesn't need to be conspiratable in my, in my opinion, it doesn't need to be a conspiracy, but it's just kind of like the, the corporate media have certain vested interests. There's a lot of money, billions of dollars at stake. And so, you know, they care about, where the discussion goes. And I think the media has been very clever to set up false dilemmas. Basically, they, in any issue, take it taxes, gun control, healthcare, whatever it is, they like to feed us the line that we only have two extreme opposite paths, right? Only two solutions or options, and they happen to be extreme and at the opposite ends of the political spectrum. And that's just nonsense. And the majority of people know it's nonsense, but 
we fall into that trap and we fight each other over those petty things when we all, you know, we all generally feel the same way. Nobody wants to worry about their kids at school. And I think, you know, I also very much agree that history is the way to do things. Cause if you look at big sets of data, you can avoid talking about anecdotals and getting emotionally evolved about what just happened. We should look at the data. And, you know, I, I did a bit of this research myself because it's been everywhere in the news recently. And again, I, I don't like to assume that I understand the situation because I, I don't focus on this. It's not my area of expertise. But it seems to me when I looked at the data, the, the biggest thing that struck me was that uh, in the past 30 years, kids, if you're talking about deaths, the biggest trend is suicides. And it correlates with prescriptions of SSRIs and various forms of speed, either Adderall or Ritalin, and other heavy farm drugs. And so I think if we're serious about addressing this problem, that would probably be the first thing that I would look at is like, look, you know, way more kids are dying to suicide than anything else. Why? And uh, is there a correlation or causation caused by these pharmaceuticals? I don't think we know necessarily the answer because I'm sure a lot of that research has been oppressed in certain ways or neglected or what have you. But I think it, you're right. Point out, look at the data, look at history, and it's much easier to get a clearer view of what's actually going on that isn't based on your personal ideology. Easy trap to fall in because we all have it. But I think that's uh, your best bet. Yeah. And, you know, those drugs to me, I like to call them the demon drugs, because if you read their names, it, it sounds like demons, like Zoroflax yeah. or Zor whatever the fuck they're called. You know, like that shit sounds like the name of a demon. And people there's probably people listening right now who've had those prescribed to them, might even currently have them prescribed. Absolutely. And I, I just want everyone to know that the like the real way to deal with anxiety and things brought on by trauma or self-loathing is actually by working with your physical body. You can move out all of those things physically uh, through practices like Tai Chi and Qigong without the need for the prescriptions that can help yourself get off of those things and start actually taking responsibility for your own moods and thoughts. Not that that's something you're incapable of now if you're on those things, but the entire Western medicine paradigm, not that it's completely without its uses. Cause you know, if I get shot, I want to go to the hospital ER right away. But you know, if I'm talking about psychological issues or things that are a result of behavioral or eating or non-activity or th habits like that, they just want to give you that bandaid to cover up the actual, you know, bullet wound to continue that metaphor that <laughs> you've, you've got to actually take matters into your own hands. Like it's going to be the way that you unlock that creative side of yourself and imaginative side of yourself. Your mind is not free to wander and, and, and create sublime imaginings. If you are bogged down, spending all your energy, not dying from poison being in your system. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, if kids are hyperactive, what they need to do is move around. I know myself that uh, all through college, I was one of the most active students as far as engaged and asking questions and all of that, but I would always be drawing. So I would take notes on one half of the page and then I would draw on the other half of the page. And I'd usually tell my professor at the first class, I'd be like, Hey, I'm going to be drawing all the time. I just want to let you know, it's not a disrespect. I'm paying attention, but I needed that motor skill going on. And I think a lot of kids, it's the same thing. They just need to get up and move. Before we drug them, we should try that first. But I also, you know, I'm very quick. I want to point out that I do have some friends that have, have taken SSRIs and they strike me as well-adjusted and awesome people and some of my favorite people in the world. So it's, it's easy to like get these sound bites and think we're like demonizing people that might be on these drugs or have been on them. Mm. And I think, you know, for some people, they have a very serious balance and that our medicine is really good for that. So this might be a godsend for let's say five or 10% of the population that legitimately needs it. But what's happened is we've over prescribed it because there's a profit incentive. And so that's really my gripe. I don't want to be here saying that they're causing all of our woes, but they're part of our woe. And we should be honest about, you know, investigating them. And 
exploring alternative medicine. So I think like you said, a physical practice, uh, some Tai Chi, yoga, stretching, breathing is very important. If you want to do meditation and breathing bonus, but I think, you know, look at those, look at CBDs, natural remedies, and then you can explore those other options. And I, I, I guess my point is that we are quick to jump right to the fix me with a pill option and who wouldn't want that. So it's, it's really easy to say, Oh, well not me. And I think, you know, like any other person, I think I go through uh, my bouts of happiness and bouts of depression, but I don't think that I've been in a dark enough place for a long enough time to feel like I could have used one of those or really needed it at some point in my life. But I want to say that maybe, you know, there's probably some people I do know that legitimately benefited from it. So the biggest thing for me is just don't push them on our kids. And especially with the SSRIs, it seems like until we do 50 to 100 years of research, we sh definitely shouldn't be prescribing them to kids with developing minds. That just seems as bad as how we rolled out GMOs to me. There's a lot of those things that we've rolled out without planning it. And when it comes down to it, yeah, you can point at big corpse and big pharma and say, these are the, the demons running amok. These are the people that are preying on the innocent. And well, yeah, that's true. There are people out there preying on the innocent, but what set them up to even have the opportunity in the first place was that as a culture, as a society, we wanted to trade responsibility for convenience and that immediately enslaves you, actually, no matter what, like whatever the situation, as soon as you trade your own personal responsibility for something that you need uh, for a convenience that you become dependent on, then whatever that thing is you're dependent on, it is your master in a way until you break that dependency. And human beings were not naturally in that state. We used to be completely self-reliant. And you also completely destroy any kind of tyranny that's possible by a government or a society if you have a culture of completely self-reliant individuals because no one can tell you, hey, you have to come fight in this war or you or you have to go work this factory or whatever the case because I can just go grow my own food. I can just go I can just get away from you and do what I want. <laughs> yeah. You know? Absolutely. And, and we're definitely becoming more and more dependent on that system. I think we should investigate what the right balance is, because clearly, collectively, we can accomplish some pretty awesome things. Right. On. And, you know, and, and hey, I'm sitting here. We have this laptop. We have iPhones. That's all globalization. And it's allowing for some pretty cool things, even though there's underlying issues with how we set this all up. Right. You know, everything's a, a micro of a macro. And if we want to complain about like politics here and pay equity and just equality in general, then we we probably have to extrapolate past the United States of America to the rest of the world. And that's a whole nother discussion of redistribution that a lot of people don't want to go anywhere near. But I think it's always important that we can separate, especially when we talk of politics, you can theorize about like ideology and where we should come from as just a matter of like morals. And then you can talk about where we could actually take things. Like how do you transition from this big capitalist praise money society that doesn't care for humanity or human happiness? How do we transition to that slowly to a society that has more of the values that hunter gatherers society tribes had, right? So there's no going back. We can't go back, but we can transition. And I think that a lot of times when artists and young people speak very idealistically, people are, you know, they turn them off because they're like, that could never happen. And, and they might be right. It could never happen right now, but maybe in hundreds of years it could happen. So I like to, I kind of like to like, think of the libertarian ideology like this. There's a lot of things that I love about it. And I do think that giving the most amount of freedom would, it would create a society where people really were thriving. I don't think we could just switch to it tomorrow. If we just got hmm. rid of the Department of Education, there'd be a lot of people that don't have a lot of money that would be screwed. And you would have some, you know, some very privileged people who would be okay under that system. 
But ultimately, I don't find a big problem with the ideology itself, that we should be allowing every citizen the most amount of freedom they can without infringing on other people's rights to do the same. Yeah, I don't even think it's a question of whether we can or can't allow people the freedom because you can't ever stop someone from doing any one thing. So when, you know, education, it, it should be more about how to be a good human that interacts with others in a way that's not harmful to themselves or others, you know, more than about learning any specific maths or particular sciences. There are certain things that would be important life skills for sure, but we're in the age of information and ignorance is totally a choice at this point. We were talking about all those various programs that you and I are teaching to ourselves. My major when I went to school was creative writing. So that has had nothing to do with anything that I've been doing uh, for money or personal vocation since then. You know, it's like everything that you see me doing, I pretty much figured out how to do. And everyone's got the capability to be completely autodidactic. And actually, what you're saying is focusing on creating solutions more than railing about the problems in the first place. And I think that's definitely what the artist's role is, is to be the one that's showing actual things that we can do and build that are going to change us for the better. And back to what we first started talking about, kind of the stupidity of nationalism when, you know, all that is, is just yet another religion, except it's called the state instead of the church. (laughs) Well, what our actual heritage ancestrally is as people in the United States is a very specific type of industrious ingenuity, creativity, and rugged individualism and non-dependence on big systems. And it's rather uh, ridiculous that we've even gotten to the point with this giant federal monster government thing when, you know, the people that had to fight a war to be independent would probably be pretty upset to see what was going on if we were to go get a medium and ask them. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And anybody that is actually fiscally conservative would say that, yeah, the two parties are the same party because they spend tons of money, both of them. Neither of them cares about spending our money because that's what it is. Uh, They're spending our money on their friends. So really, we've we've found ourselves in a place where uh, no taxation without representation. Here it is all over again. But I I would like to say I want to push back a little bit on um, the idea that um, ignorance is a choice. I think that it's very true for some of us. But then it's also kind of like this politics things like I'm a little bit disappointed that more people aren't engaged and well informed. But the other side of that is a lot of people don't have the time to do so. So like if, you know, I'm a white male, I'm fairly privileged, even though I grew up pretty poor in Vermont. And so I had the time to think about these things and to even have the thought of like, oh, I should be paying attention to politics or whatever it is. So I want to be, you know, I want to acknowledge that it's very carefully been planned that a lot of people don't have extra time to educate themselves and to learn new skills and to be a good human to their neighbors. That that's part of our problem is we've, we've forgot about the time that it takes to be part of a community that's thriving. Going back to what you were saying earlier, like if robots ever replace all of the drudgery and all the labor that we don't want to be doing, this is why I've always gone back to I, I didn't really like the Industrial Revolution or the Green Revolution with farming. It's like, great, we can feed more people, but like, are our lives actually getting better? Is my life more enjoyable? And I think that if you're making the argument to me that our current life is more enjoyable than a hunter-gatherer tribe's life, I, I just don't see it because I feel like they had maybe not only more free time, but they actually had a strong connection with the world around them and with what they did on the daily and to their own survival. So I feel like without having like a standing army and borders and nuclear weapons that were guarding them, they actually had a great sense of security. And I feel like that's one of the things that we're missing. We're, we're missing that sense of security because we really don't have it. We've abdicated it to some other power. And so, you know, we could tie this all into the to the gun debate. I think that any sane approach, we would look at a multifaceted approach to this. And guns are certainly part of the issue. But I don't think that banning them outright is going to do anything. Just like trying to ban 
the mentally ill from having guns. It, these mass murders are anomalies, so that'll actually have no effect statistically. Um, and you can look at that. That's proven. But still, we should probably have some type of mental health checks. It's a good idea to do, regardless of whether it's going to stop a new one, right? So I think, you know, w- with all these things, it's very nuanced. And what we're going to be fed is something that's not really going to help the problem. What we need to do is we need to organize from the bottom up. And remember that any uh, significant positive change throughout history has always come from the bottom up. Yeah. And it's always, you know, we can't get caught up on the, like the people's champions that arise in the political realm. And this one's going to save us. This is our new daddy or whoever it is, <laughs> right or left, because that's all just a form of the dialectic you're talking about when you think there's only two choices and they, it's. It's the uh, evil of two lessers, not the lesser of two evils. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's what we are handed. And we could easily just be literally building something different. And there are many people that are doing this, creating sovereign tribes, uh, you know, with their own internal generation of their resources that they need. And if there was enough network uh, tribes like that, I don't really see what could happen to stop an entirely different way of you know, changing our, our community ecology into something where the, the creative, the creative capacity and productivity of an individual is actually respected. Whereas now it's so silly what even passes for pay rates from one job to another and how arbitrary it is. Like how come the guy that's working his ass off cleaning all the stuff in the building gets paid one one millionth of the CEO. Yeah. And it's not that there should be rules. There shouldn't be rules that say they have to pay this guy equal what this guy gets paid. There shouldn't be rules like that at all. The guy that's just getting ripped off like that should just say, oh, I'm not going to do this and go <laughs> do something that's better for himself. You know, that's kind of that's what it always comes back to to me is that as bad as any system of society is, it's only uh, it only goes as far as the people who are willing to play the game. Yeah, I I think that's fair to say, you know, and this might go back to the classic, this is politics again, right? Some people view the world as blaming the system and other people blame the individual, right? So classically, at least right now, the Republicans are like, you know, uh, work harder and you'll get by. And the Democrats are like, oh, everything's unfair. And I think there's got to be truth to both, right? Certainly, I think we could foster a system that that encourages people to do the right thing and encourages the best traits out of humans. And right now we kind of have the opposite of that. We have a system that encourages the most petty, uh, greedy behavior. But then at the same time, the individual can overcome all of that. You can actively choose to not participate in systems of control. You can fight against institutionalized racism by trying to end the war on drugs there's all sorts of things you can do to empower yourself. So you, you can't always just be playing the victim. And I think it's fair and necessary for us to admit that, you know, when we talk of all these things, there is that dualistic nature. Yeah, that's what I've been appreciating the most out of talking with you, man, is that whenever I bring up any point or we are talking about pretty much anything, you're always right there in the middle with saying, well, there's truth to both sides. And that's actually such an important thing to keep in mind when you talk to anybody, especially someone that's highly polarized onto one side or another of any particular debate is the fact that as soon as you try to tell someone they're wrong, then they put all their attention into proving you wrong or just defending themselves and not listening to you at all. So it's always best whenever entering into any conversation with somebody to always remind yourself that, Well, there's truth to what they're saying from their perspective. It might not be the ultimate actual correct truth, but in their mind, in their perspective, there's a reason they think it. And it might not be a good reason, but as soon as you ease up and just let them have their point and then talk to them about your point, it's a respect thing. You'll you'll be more likely to get it back. And I've (laughs) man, I've had some experiences like at music festivals, for example, where (laughs) I don't know if you've had this happen, but sometimes there's somebody that's on the wrong combination of their SSRIs and psychedelics or something. And and they come up to you and they're yelling you about how Obama is the Antichrist and Jesus is coming next year. And they're positive. And until you look them in the eye and be like, yeah, man, they're going to follow you around and like freak out at you. I don't know if you've ever had somebody like that in your face, but it happens. And like, 
I fig- I figured it out eventually that all you got to do to shake them off is just be like, co- just cool with whatever it is that they're coming at you with. And then they'll kind of just like look for somebody else to mm, sort of have that combative interaction with. Cause for whatever reason, that's the loop that they're caught in while they're on their uh, cocktail of whatever. You know, it doesn't even necessarily take when you introduce uh, hallucinogens or any other drugs that it can exasperate those issues. But it doesn't even take any type of mind altering substance for some people to be like that. Right. And everybody, we all know somebody who loves to be miserable or, you know, it's just we get comfortable in our patterns. It's easy to spot that. And I do, you know, painting every weekend for the past uh, six years in a row. I've run into a lot of different types of folks. There's always at least a few, probably three or four times every summer, I'll run into some people where I just don't even know what's happening in the conversation. And I'm, I always try to be nice and I don't want to be rude, but I'm also trying to paint. So sometimes it's a little awkward for me to figure out ways to break off. But then again, I guess it might be easier for me because I have my painting there. So I can always start to just paint and make less eye contact and it's probably even more awkward for regular festival goers. Um, but I, I think you're right. All you could do is kind of smile and laugh and, and, you know, nod your head and, and let them move on to argue with somebody else. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. If you don't, you don't have to feed into any conflict that ever comes your way. And like, what do you care if they have a crazy opinion in the first place? It's way better to just focus on doing your painting and that, is actually more likely to be the right example to the crazy person than any argument you can make to them is to just show them what it looks like for somebody to be fearlessly doing their thing in the face of any weirdness. <laughs> sure. you, you, have, you don't have to prove yourself. That's your ego. You know, it's, you don't have to prove that you're right. I, I want to know more about your uh, travels on the live painting festival circuit. Yeah. You know, tell people a little bit about your history doing that and, sort of what it's like, what do you enjoy about it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, oh man, like I said, I guess, um, this is either my sixth or seventh summer touring uh, full time. So basically every weekend from May till September, uh, I do a festival and I, I release a tour poster every summer and I do a contest, which actually I'm, I'm dropping tomorrow, April 2nd where people can comment and then they have a chance to win one of my originals. But yeah, every year I do this tour poster and I try to keep people informed of where I'm going to be painting at. I kind of got my start in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, It's a pretty small city. And I was working with a DJ collective called Mush Post and then a uh, couple of hip hop groups underneath DJ Kanga. And he hosts uh, Yo BTV Raps up in Burlington. It's like an old school hip hop event. He's a vinyl DJ, so he actually scratches, which is awesome to see. And he's, he's really good. He's, you know, he could tour nationally if he wanted to. Uh, he just had a kid, so I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But so I got my start at the local level. Uh, just kind of painting some some bars, and then uh, and I think it was I think it was 2012, and I was painting uh, corporate mascots like all the cartoon characters from your childhood, uh, Ronald McDonald, the Monopoly Man, Toucan Sam, like dozens and dozens of them as like an anti-war protest. So I painted them. The first one was Ronald McDonald, and he was on like an old clunky like 80s cell phone. And he's like looking away and smiling. And then in his other hand, he's like nonchalantly dropping these bombs. And at first I was just kind of thinking, you know, like bomb dropping as a a reference to what DJs do in the music field. And then somebody said like, oh, great. You know, that's a that's a great statement on the war right now. And I was like, you know what? It, It kind of is. This is exactly what America consumerism does. Like here we are, fake happy smile. And on the other hand, we're like bombing people and not thinking about it. So it was very politically charged and it was interesting because I was working larger than I had ever worked before, but it was these big cartoon characters. So it wasn't necessarily my own artwork. Like I was doing my own rendering of the character, but I felt like I really wanted to start painting more of my work the next year. So I jumped into that and I was doing all black and whites, uh, 2013, which went pretty well. But as soon as I started working in color the very next year, I got a, a much better response. Everybody wanted to buy the colored works. And so that kind of taught me a lesson of, of what I thought was interesting versus uh, the value that I was bringing 
to people, you know, what I perceived versus what they perceived. And then, oh boy, I think 2015 was Purple Rain tour after Prince died. So it was all purple pieces. And now I'm just about to do my latest tour is called Pound the Pavement tour. So it's kind of just taking me all over the country, Colorado, New Hampshire, Maine. And it's really a great time. If I didn't find live painting, I probably would not have kept up with artwork. The primary reason being that it's very difficult to just create the artwork, let alone sell it. And when you do live painting, you kind of accomplish part two, which is the marketing and meeting people who want to buy the artwork. And then there's the additional, there's the added bonus of getting inspiration from the venue, the event, the music that happens to be playing. And I've even done some events that were like, like uh, one of the McKenna's speaking. Uh, so like just events in general where there's a bunch of speakers and there's that hum of background activity and people talking, um, even that has an effect on your work. So that's kind of the, the extra bonus, I guess I would like to say. Yeah, there's completely different energy in those big live events. You know, we were talking about like woo woo stuff before, but the concept, the new age slash ancient concept of the aura, totally, it bears out scientifically because you can measure electromagnetic fields that generate from a person's heart and create a actual, a noticeable effect between 10 to 60 meters away from the person. And whenever you have so many people together, all those fields link up and that's, there's information that actually goes from you to other people through that field. And that's maybe like where we get some of the strange psychic experiences we have. And there also seems to be a non-local aspect to it as well for people that are really well connected to each other. And that's like, you know, your quantum weirdness, your quantum entanglement, whatever you want to, you know, call it. But in those spaces, I find even not being on a stage, just doing my doodles, I get way more weird, cool inspiration just being at a place like that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, you know, some people, I think a lot of artists in particular are um, empaths or empathetic. And I think that a lot of artists are extra sensitive to the energy that other people are giving off. And so I don't know how it works. I can't explain it, but I definitely know that I'm, I'm sensitive to the energy of the people that are around me. And that certainly shows itself through my work. I can think of a number of times where I was uh, several states or all the way across the country um, from where I lived at an event and things weren't going right. And I was supposed to perform um, and it affected my performance. So I think uh, it's, it's, you got to you gotta know and recognize when that's happening, I guess, and take a step back from it and be able to have perspective on that's happening. But it's also very cool that you can tap into that in the right situations too. So there's a lot of positive energy and a lot of love behind an event. You can tell through the work and you, you can tell how, how people are uh, fulfilling their duties. Yeah, the community of those festivals is what draws us out there, isn't it? Like sometimes whenever you get to the actual place that you're going, what like the, whether even if it's out in the middle of nowhere or, you know, something like that, probably Burning Man would be huge. I've never been to it, but sometimes you just enter into the vicinity of that big tribe and all of a sudden your entire mood just shifts. So it's, it's quite interesting. You can find yourself with energy to be up all night working on art where back at your house, you can you know, barely keep yourself focused on it. It's cool to get outside of the, like that is one of the other advantages is getting outside of your den to do your work and your creations and being that per being that version of yourself outside of just in your alone time, because you have to cultivate it in your alone time. But you know, it, it's pretty interesting to actually get to take that new persona, that self-created pers version of yourself out there and get a little bit of appreciation and, because, you know, people are so nice, whatever. That's one of the things that the emerging artists might not realize is that you're going to have a lot more compliments and, and all that than any haters. And by the time you start getting enough haters happening, that's just a, for you to know that, ah, wow, I'm really doing well, actually. <laughs> that's the sign that you've made it. Um, and I think, you know, I think you just touched on a, a fourth bonus. I wasn't even thinking of the live painting. Um, it helps you travel. 
And a lot of these festivals are in beautiful locations. So I think before I may have been a little bit, not obsessed, but um, a little too interested in doing larger and larger events. And I definitely find that the smaller festivals are um, more compatible and compassionate towards the live painters. So as soon as you get 10,000 or over, it's kind of a cold environment to deal with. Uh, They don't quite recognize the value of live painters as they do musicians yet. But what I'm focusing on this year is is a lot of smaller events that are close to my heart. Tumble Down, which is Twiddles Festival in Burlington, Vermont. That's probably the most gorgeous location you could ever have for a day concert. Um, it's not camping, but definitely worth checking out. They do late night shows after the event. Wildwoods, which is a page farm in New Hampshire, that hosts a lot of festivals and they've continually invested in their property. So just the other year, they built a giant... Um, like warehouse barn space that's going to host the art gallery. So look out for Wildwoods as being a great artist festival. And kind of just any of these smaller festival, Wild Vibes is a really small one in Maine. Um, You're going to have the best experience there as a live painter. And I think if you want to do the larger events, just make sure you you have a giant following so you can demand some type of compensation because it's a lot more work doing a larger event. And also really important, like I mentioned, you don't want to get all the way across the country and realize that the festival is going to bail on their, their end of the agreement. So I think it's really important when you're dealing with any festival that has corporate sponsors, get yourself a contract and to have in place in that contract terms for what happens if they don't fulfill their end. Because that's the biggest thing. I think every contract I've signed to this point for festivals had no information on what happens if they fall through. Of course, there were stipulations if the artist falls through, right? So, you know, that's one of the things. Being an artist these days, it requires a lot more than just the actual art. If you want to make that your vocation, you have to be able to market yourself online and offline. You have to make business cards. You have to figure out how to replicate your art for sales. You have to get yourself a website and you have to be a negotiator on your own behalf. And that's, man, that's so hard because. A lot of us creative types are just wanting to be easygoing and kind of bumble through stuff without having to worry about those details as much. And unfortunately, as soon as the thing that you're doing starts having like a real dollar value that is getting a a rising dollar value on, you know, I hate to value things in money. But like once the fact of the matter is that it has that association, then you've got those that want to kind of prey on that. And it's not it's nothing unnatural. That's just like, that's just the way of the world and you got to be ready for it. It doesn't make it a bad gig to be an artist or anything. And it's not that different than any other profession you might find yourself in. There's going to be sometimes there's going to be all kinds of people that you have to deal with. So you just got to be ready for that and make sure you're putting the right value on your own self and what it is that you're doing that you uh, send the message that, that you're, worth respecting, I guess. And it's, it's a tricky thing. I think that for the most part, just showing respect to others and yourself by not, um, not going in somewhere unprepared is the way to do it. Because, you know, if you don't prepare, you're preparing to fail. Yeah, sure. (laughs) You know, it's interesting uh, to the point of artists being taken advantage of. I definitely have a, a couple of personal friends who, uploaded their artwork onto internet sites for the sale of um, either tapestries or all over t-shirt prints. And they're working with a particular company and that company sold their images to another dozen companies without telling them. And those companies were selling that artist product without giving any, without giving royalties on the product. So I know that's happened to a couple of uh, friends of mine personally. So that is out there. I think it's good to temper it with the idea that, you know, so these companies that push products and market are providing a service. So when I was younger, I turned down an opportunity to work with a t-shirt company um, because they only wanted to give me 30% of their profits, I think. And at the time, I think I let my ego get in the way and I was a little offended and I was like, oh my God, 30%, like you got to be kidding me. And now looking back on it, I think that percentage is probably pretty fair. If they're investing in the the money and the product, storing the product, selling it and shipping it and everything, 30% for the creator 
sounds spot on, but at the time I remember being kind of offended. So I think that's important for emerging artists to realize is that uh, sometimes you do need help and there is value in other people providing that service, but you have to be smart about it. And like you said, not, not get taken advantage of. I think for me, my, uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, also related is my end goal, which is kind of creating uh, this live work community studio. And it's, to address this issue, essentially. I, I definitely see an opportunity for some place like AS220 in Rhode Island is kind of going to be our model, but just an opportunity to, to fill the gaps where emerging artists need some help. So I want to make a live work studio where we have all the gear that an artist would need to begin a professional career. So essentially scanners, photography equipment, printing equipment. And then it would be a subsidized living. So people who are accepted can get a bit of money off their rent. And we would also bring shows to the venue. So ultimately, I would love to have enough land where we can throw a festival once or twice a year. But even if it's just a single night venue, I think it would be really huge if we could provide a space where the musicians and the shows came to the artist. Because I, I don't know, I know countless artists who are absolutely amazing and rarely ever get their life together. And most of them don't have cars or ready access to transportation. And so I think it would be huge if we could kind of provide a venue where we bring people to the artists, we give them the tools to make a product that people want to sell, we show them how to sell it, and then show them that they can do it. And the ones that are successful, hopefully will end up donating to the foundation as they move forward in their professional careers. And I just think this is such a no brainer for any artist who is heavily invested in themselves as their own business because not, I don't, I know that I need a printer to print my prints, but we could easily have a dozen artists sharing that printer. It makes all the sense in the world to do it. So that's kind of my, my big end goal. And I think the last part of the puzzle is just figuring out where it's going to be. Location is going to be huge for funding and access and everything. So that's a big question still, but I know that as soon as we get that in place, we'll be, we'll be moving forward pretty quickly with it. Right on, man. That actually is a brilliant scheme for lack of better words, because that's one of the hardest things about being an artist is you have to spend so much time honing your craft, whatever it is, and then somehow making enough money working odd side jobs without spending too much time working on those yeah. jobs to not actually have the energy to do art, to buy the equipment and tools you need and different, different mediums require different levels of tools for sure. <laughs> and it's tricky too, because if you go too far into the, the work world and out of the, the starving artist world, you wind up where I'm at personally, where I work 40 hours a week at a pretty, pretty good job. And now I have like I eat really, really well and I have kind of a nice place to live and I have all this stuff. And if I was just to pull the rug out from under myself, then I wouldn't be able to afford the cat food that I need to feed my animals. And, you know, maybe I could just kind of pull the ripcord and become eventually become a full time just artist and podcaster if I started putting all my time into it. But now I'm in sort of a transitionary phase where I just have to work 80 hours a week instead and have two yeah. full time jobs being an artist and a podcaster and doing the doing the regular, as Chris Dyer called it, peasant work sure, sure. <laughs> when, I, when I talked to him. But, you know, because he, he was talking about this very thing, how he had to be on welfare when he was starting out just to be able to put the time in to what he was doing. So creating a space where people can share the things like the scanners and the, you know, being the other big part of it is that you're around other people who want to be productive and want to pursue self-expression. Yep. And that's to any creative person or really anybody that's gotten their life together to any degree will tell you, yeah, you got to actually pay attention to who it is that you're hanging around. It's not that you can't have friends that really love to watch football games and eat hot wings. But if that's something that you're regularly around, you are going to be a little more interested in that than you would be otherwise. It's kind of like you become the people that you are you become a blend of the people that you're closest with in a very, a very woo woo way, actually. I mean, to you say you're empathic and sensitive. You may have noticed this. Like I sometimes can start to see someone's facial features and expressions changing if they've been hanging out with different people. Like we literally take on each other's energy in this weird, 
a uh, real yeah. way and being around other people that are driven, have the same type of dream as you, and you can co- share and collaborate. There's just no end to the ex- expanding of the energy potential for, for those people. It's a great idea. I wish you all the luck in the world finding a good spot for it because it's only a matter of time. It will definitely manifest if you've got this kind of a uh, let's move towards the wrap up and you tell us a little bit about where you're going to be this year, what you've got going on that people can see you at. Sure. Yeah. Let me grab my tour poster real quick. So this will be dropping tomorrow on the second. Man, the first event is actually coming up this weekend, which I think this will air afterwards was called minus zero. Uh, that should be a fun one in Vermont. Some other ones I'm looking forward. I mentioned the Rail Aquarium show, uh, which is Govinda the Kaminanda. It's going to be amazing. Uh, really, what I'm looking most forward to is painting with Twiddle at Red Rocks out in Col- Colorado. That's a uh, Twiddle and Stick figure, I believe. And that'll be May 4th. And then they have their festival, Tumble Down. Wild Woods is one that I'm always involved with. And uh, for the people that are cannabis connoisseurs, you should keep in mind the Kind Mind Campout. This is the first year they're doing it. It's on the old grounds of where Great North used to be, which was one of my favorite festivals. I think it got a little bit corporate. Uh, The last couple of years I wasn't there, so I wasn't witness to it myself, but I heard some bad stories. So I'm kind of going to be all over the Northeast and making a a May trip to Colorado. Um, And then... My big event, uh, it's called the Juicy Art Market. So if any other uh, live painters, uh, performance painters, or visionary artists are listening, please feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to be a part of that. It happens on Santa Fe Drive, uh, which is in Denver, Colorado, where they do the first Friday art walk. Basically, we just throw a big shindig. There's a bunch of live painters, hoopers, LED performers. We had a crazy stage that was all lit up. Insane last year. A bunch of bands play. And it's great. It's a big party. A couple thousand people attend every first Friday and they walk the streets on both sides. It's, it's like a mile or two strip where every business is pretty much a gallery. So it's a cool, cool place to check out. I, I like to say, though, that a lot of the galleries kind of have a lot of uh, safe artwork that is, I don't know, it, it's good. It's technically good, but it might not be pushing any boundaries. Or it might not seem like new or fresh or something you haven't seen before. And I think um, that's something that we can offer at the Juicy Art Market. Uh, Again, that's going to happen June 1st, which is the first Friday this summer. Yeah, I think that's my biggest thing. Juicy Art Market and uh, patreon.com slash highlig art. It's my big push. As you know, it's it's not easy to find people on Patreon. You kind of have to push your, your own network of people to the page. You're not going to get discovered on there. So my biggest thing right now is figuring out ways to advertise and get the word out. Cause I know there's, there's so many people that make good money every year and for them a dollar a month is nothing. But if you got 50 or a hundred of those people together, for me, that's, you know, uh, significant. And if I can, if I can get rid of having to worry about pushing my product so much, It'll just allow me to create more artwork and then get started on this uh, live work studio for other artists. So that's exciting and also daunting. It's going to be a lot of work. I love it, man. I definitely want to see your studio come to fruition and maybe come check it out myself. I want to have you back on the show sometime down the road as well. So just, you know, hit me up if you can't wait because I've taken too long or something. We'll make it happen. It's been a blast talking to you, man. And I have a few more things I want to talk to you off the air, but I will go ahead and wrap up the interview section for now. And the floor is yours. Express whatever you want to the to the peeps. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thank you so much for having me, Chance. It's been a lot of fun. And I just want to say I, I think everybody uh, should be doing something creative, whether it's artwork or dance or cooking Whatever, whatever you're interested in and you can put your thought process towards it and express yourself. I think that's lovely. We need to be doing more of that. And uh, thank you so much for having a, a venue that spreads this type of knowledge and this type of interaction. It's great. Thank you for coming on, man. You're definitely the exact type of person I like to feature. And this has been one of the, in my opinion, one of the better conversations about what it's like for the emerging artist and what it takes and what to sort of expect, although really expectations are something you should throw away as well. But (laughs) yeah, it's been been awesome chatting with you, man. I look forward to seeing what you produce and 
great, great artwork. Love the gradients you do and the colors just are one of a kind, unique. Love everything I've seen from you. Can't wait to see more and best of luck with all you've got coming up this year. Thank you so much. I'm so honored. My friends, we have completed another episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and big thanks to Nicholas Heilig. I do hope you have checked out his art by now on Instagram or somewhere else online. His Patreon would be a great place to go. I actually became a patron myself. I can tell you that he's got a lot of updates rolling through there. You'll see much more pretty things if you're following him and subscribed on Patreon than you would if you're just checking out his Instagram. And you'll be supporting somebody who's got big plans in the world to help other artists emerge out of their shells and find a way to be self-sufficient off their creations. And I think that's the coolest thing, really, is when somebody's path actually leads them to be able to help others with their path. So if you want to hear a little bit more about that, you can get on Patreon for Interverse, which is patreon.com forward slash Interverse. Sign up for Plus and... I'll let you know a few of the things that we talked about in the episode extension. We went more into some of his ideas about the live or live in studio space for artists and some of the places that are near and dear to his heart that are doing a similar thing already. We talked about why it matters so much to be surrounded by people who share a similar purpose to yours and about utilizing the resources that are available to artists through local government grants and things like that, that some cities provide. And then Heilig got into a story about butterfly moth synchronicities at Rootwire Festival and how that connected to a story that Crystallize shared with us several episodes back in season three. I think it's really interesting how many of these music festival synchronicities with painters involve insects. And I've probably mentioned this before, but I've had quite a few music festival synchronicities revolving around insects doing things that don't really make sense other than if it's somehow... (laughs) I don't know, something supernatural going on. It's hard to say, but you should definitely get into the plus extension to hear about all that and a lot of great contemplations on the nature of infinity and the interconnectedness of all life too. Wow. And ways to engage the left and right brain simultaneously, ideas about how to help and influence your community without sabotaging yourself. And we even got into a cool conversation about what would happen to our national and religious differences if aliens invaded. So, yeah, a lot of the juicy, delicious content is really right there in plus. So I do recommend you get on there and you'll be supporting this podcast. Think of it like if you had a musician or a painter and you bought their CD or their print. That's kind of like what it is whenever you buy Interverse Plus subscriptions. You're you're supporting my personal form of creativity and you're getting access to it in a much better way earlier episode posting a lot of the time, maybe not on this one, (laughs) and you get double the length of episodes up to. This one's not quite double, but that's because I wanted to include some of his conversation about the studio idea in the uh, free show because it's such a cool thing. So you guys got a little bit longer of a free show this time. 
But yeah, you guys could definitely support the podcast through Patreon and you can support the podcast through getting on iTunes and subscribing and leaving us a five-star review. That's also really helpful. We got a few more five-star reviews since the last episode and big thank you to you guys who did that for me. You did not leave any written review, so I can't read what you wrote here on the show live. But if you guys do get on iTunes and leave a review and actually write something, I'll read it on the show in an upcoming outro. And hopefully you say something nice or funny or uh, just, you know, not really mean. I'll read it either way and we'll all have a good chuckle if you make fun of me. And that's fine. So... That's about all I've got to say for this here outro. I'm getting ready to be on my way to Mulberry Mountain for the Backwoods Festival that you've heard me go on about in the last few weeks. So hopefully I can harvest some really good synchronicity stories there while I'm out on the mountain and enjoy some nature and some music and be around my festival family. I'll probably see some of you there, actually. So thanks for listening. Thank you for the support and thank you for you know, looking for a way to engage your own inner creator and inspire yourself because that's what this show is all about. And if it's working, then I am very happy. (laughs) And if it's not, let me know why not. And we'll talk about it. I'm very open to constructive criticism. I'm trying to make this show the best I can. I want to know what it is that might keep somebody from subscribing to plus if they're not. And if it's a money thing, it is a $5 a month subscription. I understand that's a little pricey, but You'd pay more than that for Netflix, and I don't know. It just seems like it might be better for you because it's not so distracting. You can listen to it while you're like doing chores or something. A lot of people I know listen to the show while they're actually creating art, so I find that to be really interesting. Why not send me a picture of something you made while you were listening to the show? That would be cool. I'll share it on social media if you want me to. And that goes for anything that you guys are into. If you're a wire wrap artist, if you... You know, if you make jewelry, if you paint, if you draw, if you've got a page that you want to get a little bit of exposure, why not send me a message? Send me a link to your page. I'll happily share it on my Facebook or Twitter or wherever I can to give you a little bit more exposure. That's sort of what I'm all about here is helping us all rise together. So I love you. That being said, I think I'm done with this ramble. Again, make sure you check the show notes for links to Heilig. Also, the awesome music that was in this episode is by a dude who goes by the moniker Mild West, and you can find him on SoundCloud. That will also be linked in the show notes. So yeah, show notes are where it's at, man. You can find them on interversepodcast.com or in whatever podcast player you're looking at the show through. So check the links, check out the art, check out the music, follow, 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 subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Let's all get linked up. It's better for all of us. Okay. I'm done. I'm going to start last minute prepping for this festival. That's kind of how I always do it. (laughs) And thanks for checking out the show. Love you guys very much. Thank you, Heilig. I had a great time talking to you. We will do it again. And I can't wait to meet you in Meat Space. All right. This is Chance signing off.
second chances I'd rather keep it candid Don't need no second chances I'd rather Don't need no second chances Take all that you were handed 